with these three filters, we can combine them to make a color picture, but we got to do a little bit of stuff before we get to that point. So after these, these data sets are selected, what do I do with them? Well, I want to retrieve them. So the way we retrieve them here is kind of like when you go shopping online, you have a shopping cart, you pick your, uh, the stuff you want to buy and add it to the shopping cart. Well, we do that by uh, saying add selection to cart. We push that button. And now we see there's a tab at the top that's turned yellow, and it's got a little shopping cart icon, and it's those three files. So we click on that tab, and we see this list. So now we see the list of only those observations that we selected and added to the shopping cart. So now we just go fetch that data. We hit the Fetch HLA Data button, and that will start the retrieval, and through the browser, it will retrieve uh, a data uh, and what it actually does is, is it uh, zips those all the files into one zip file, zip archive file and retrieves that. So if I pick save file and say okay that's actually gonna send it to my desktop. And so then you'd have to go to wherever it unloaded it on your desktop and unzip the archive. Now I'm not gonna uh, hunt around on my desktop too much. I've got this. So that looks like it's 700 and something megabytes. That's quite a bit. Yes. So you need a pretty fast connection to be able to get that in a reasonable amount of time. Yes, that's that's right. These are fairly large files. The camera is intrinsically uh, four uh, four thousand by four thousand pixels. So that's a 16 megapixel image, and it's also a, a high bit depth image. It's a, it's actually 16 bits per pixel. So um, they, they're pretty big files. So yeah, you have to have a pretty good network connection <laughs> and you have to have a reasonably uh, high power computer to work with these data files. Uh, so let me just quickly make a comment here to people watching. If you, um, I, I forgot to mention this at the top, we are, if you have a question while Zolt is going through this, please feel free to leave it in the form of a comment uh, in the, uh, on the uh, YouTube page and we'll be checking those and we'll be responding to them as, uh, as, as Zolt goes on. So I just wanted to remind everybody because I didn't say that at the beginning. Go ahead. Okay. So this is still downloading. I don't need to worry about that. I've already downloaded these files. And these are the ones you made available in the Dropbox file, too. And these are the same ones I made available. Now, the other thing about these files that are on the Dropbox is that to kind of save time in this demonstration, I made smaller versions of files. As Tony said, these are pretty big files, and it would take a while to... We don't want to waste time just waiting for things to open in the in the software and, and work with them. So I made smaller versions. The original files are actually 8,000 by 8,000 pixels. Um, there's a these, these particular images are actually small mosaics. So the the images themselves are larger than a single frame from the Whitefield Camera 3. But um, in this case, I made smaller versions. Uh, one quarter of the size, so they're 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, so they're much more manageable, but they still have enough resolution in them so we can really see what's going on. So, uh, as I uh, navigate on my desktop to uh, where these files are, I have a folder. Uh, well, first of all, let me show you. This This is the, so I have a folder here, and the zip file that, that HLA sent me is, here's a zip file. So you you open that zip file and you end up with a folder. It actually has subfolders for each uh, each file that was downloaded, and then the file, the FITS file, was within that folder. So the files that we're getting from HLA from the archive are FITS files. This is a standard data format that astronomers use, have used for a while. It's designed for the purposes of astronomy, and it's standard throughout no matter which telescope people are using, they're similar files and same software works with these files. So That's right. If you use astronomy data, you use FITS files. That's correct. So I've, I've gotten these big files, I made smaller versions, and that's what we're going to work with. So the first step, so we've done the first step. We've done, so we have three steps. We've done the first step. We've, got, we've retrieved our data from the archive. So the next step is to process this data in something that we can actually produce a picture with. And before we, uh, the, the ultimate thing we're going to use is Photoshop because Photoshop has the tools we need to convert these 
black and white images into color Im into a color image. But before that, we need to get the data into a format that Photoshop can understand because Photoshop doesn't understand from FITS. So <laughs> there's this other piece of software called FITS Liberator, which was developed by the European Space Agency for this very purpose of taking FITS files and making an image that Photoshop can understand or any or other software can understand. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to open FITS Liberator. This is free software. It's freely available. Um, uh, I, there's a link to the to where you get it on the Hubble Image Processors page. Uh, again, it's freely available. You just install it on your system. Again, it works on Macs and PCs. It works the same. And when you start the software, so I've started the software, it starts up and asks you what you want to, what file you want to open. So it opens a file requester and here are my, I've already navigated to the right place on my disk where the files sit. So I have my three files, um, my 438, my 606 and F, the F14. I'm going to start out with the 606, the middle filter. So this is a middle wavelength that's kind of yellow light wavelengths uh, and I'm going to click on that and say choose and that will open that in Fitz Liberator. Now we're, we're uh, presented with this kind of complex panel <laughs> and again for this we're not going to go through every single option on here. Uh, the main thing you see is you see a preview panel. So you see the image popped up there uh, and you see a bunch of buttons and boxes for numbers and a little plot at the bottom. The little plot at the bottom is the histogram which shows the distribution of the, the data values in the image and gives you a rough idea of how bright the image is and, and where we're uh, scaling it and so forth. So the idea of Fitzliberator is to be able to scale the intensities, the brightnesses in this image from what they are as, as numbers in the data file to brightnesses on our screen and there's there's a number of ways we can do that. So um, the primary things about Fitz Liberator are, so over here we have buttons, we have open, save as, save it and edit and a couple of others. The important ones are open to open the file you want and save, save as and save edit. The difference between save as and save and edit is save as will simply write out a TIFF file on your back on your disk save and edit will write out file, but also open that file uh, automatically in Photoshop. I normally just save as and then use a different procedure to open all the files in Photoshop and we'll obviously go through that in a minute. So on the left there's a few buttons, there's a scroll, the hand is, uh, some of the some of this is a little bit similar to Photoshop if, you, if you're familiar with that. Uh, there's a, if you click on the magnifying glass that's a zoom so I can click in the image and zoom in on the image um, and a couple other things. So uh, so the first thing we need to do to start out is there's a bunch of different uh, methods you can use to uh, exclusively. So I use either linear some of the time depending on the image but most of the time I use this thing called arc sine h uh, and so that's already selected. Now I sort of uh, was a little bit ahead of myself in that I, uh, Fitz Liberator does remember what the settings were that you had when, if you close it and reopen it, uh, this freeze settings option will tell it to remember what all the settings were. So the next time you open it, it'll have the same settings. What I'm going to do is hit this reset button and that will set everything to defaults. And so I will go through the process of setting these parameters. Uh, from from the get go. So, so this is what you would see. This is what most people would see when they load it up for the first time. When you first load up Fitz Liberator without ever having used it before, and you open an image, this is what this is what the parameters are that starts out. So yeah. it has a linear stretch, uh, and you see some funny stuff going on in the image. Now you see these green blobs in the image. That's telling you that those the way this is scaled, the way this is intensity stretched, those green areas are going to end up all white in your in your image that you save. Now the uh, there's also, well we'll see that in a minute. So uh, there's options here, it says white clipping and black clipping. It, when those are turned on, which they are by default I believe, um, you'll see these marks 
Uh, there's, there's, it's not going to be green in your image. It's going to be white in your image. If it's blue, uh, let me see if I can reset these black points. So when it turns blue, it means that uh, the settings are such that those pixels that are displayed as blue here in Fislibrator are actually going to be black in your image. It's just telling you that all that area is going to be black in your image. And if it's if the green uh, clipping indication is turned on, that means that those pixels are going to be Yeah, but white they're just shown in those colors image. here just to show you that those are either saturated or they're being just, clipped. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. So the first thing we want to do is change this to arc sine h. And that's just the, the nice thing about that function is that it brightens the darkest parts of the image without over brightening the brightest parts of the image. Um, it's kind of like a curve setting in Photoshop, if you're familiar with that. Um, so this is very the part of the reason that this particular function is in there is that it works particularly well for astronomical images where a lot of the stuff you're interested in is down near the really dark parts of the image. It's near the background. You're always interested in the stuff that's near the background. You're not really that much interested in the brightest parts of the image, which happen to be stars, which some, most of the time the stars are much brighter than anything you're interested in in the image. So, okay, so now we've changed the, the stretch function to arc sine h. I'll, I'll drag this uh, white clipping slider over, white level slider over so I can see what's going on. And you see that now we're picking up some more, some fainter stuff in the background of the image, but we're still not picking up very much. The next thing I want to do is tell Fitz Liberator where kind of the background level of the image, the darkest parts of the image, and where the brightest parts of the image are so that it can uh, restrict its scaling to those parts of the image. And I have two convenient little buttons over here. There's a B and a P. B stands for background level or black level. And if you hover on that, it'll bring up a little tool tip that says just that, background level sampler tool. So I pick that. And if I pick, uh, go uh, to a place in the image that I say is the back, I think is the background, usually the darkest part of the image, and click on that, it will go off and recalculate and then set the background level to that. When it comes back, we'll see that over here there's a bunch of numbers background level has been set to the data value of whatever pixel I picked in the image. I'll do the same thing for the brightest part of the image. I'll pick P for peak level sampler tool and go over here and near the core of this galaxy, let me take this white level back up a little bit so it narrows down where the brightest part of the image is. I click there and that will go off and calculate for a while and come back and it has now changed the peak level. Um, doesn't really matter what that number really is. You can actually type in numbers here if you want to. If you experiment with different numbers, you can see what the results are and it may be better or worse for your image. The last thing we do is this scaled peak level. You see it's a very small number. So the higher this number is, the brighter the image is going to get. It's sort of like a gamma function, if you're familiar with that uh, image processing terminology. So I'll type in a bigger number, I'll say 10, and hit return, and it'll go off and calculate again, and we'll see what that does. Ah, it made the image brighter. Cool, that's what we want to do. We want to see all that faint stuff in the background, but it's not quite as far as I think we can go. So I'm going to go farther, and you notice I'm going by factors of 10. You can type in any number here, but uh, since this is a, you know, working in kind of logarithmic terms, uh, we're talking about uh, large factors here. Wow, so like factors that. of that's 10. a real difference. That's so nice. So now we've really brought out a lot of the background stuff. You can see there's hey, a lot of detail there. Yeah. What, the uh, stretch function you picked, any particular reason? Is that the best one? Uh, uh, that's one that works pretty well with images like this. It's actually so, very galaxies. similar with galaxies. It's very okay. similar to log. Let's go pick the log. We can change the stretch function anytime. And what the log does is, as I said before, it, it uh, increases the, actually increases the contrast at the darkest parts of the image and decreases the contrast at the brighter parts of the image. That is a real big difference. Look at that. 
Wow, look at all that detail that you can't even see there. Right. Right there, you can't even see right. it. Right, right. So now, you know, with the different functions, the numerical values are going to be a little different, so you have to play around with the different stretches. Now, I don't know if I can get a kind of apples and oranges comparison between log and arc sine h because, again, the numbers change, so I have to readjust things a little bit. But um, the so biggest you, difference, yeah, go ahead. Do you find yourself using the arc sine h one the most or when you do your work? Yeah, it's usually that one. Okay. Sometimes with a... With things that are kind of low contrast, like uh, nebulae, sometimes the linear will actually work better. Mm. But there's all kinds of other ones. There's these uh, uh, root functions and power functions, and you can even apply multiple ones. So you can have arc sine h of arc sine h or log of log. It's, it gets a little complicated, but you know, it's a matter of ex at this point, it's a matter of experimentation. And and this is kind of where we shift over from being in the science realm to more being in the art realm. So there's a lot of uh, of l more subjective choices here. We're not talking about photometrically accurate astronomy here. We're not talking about me measuring brightnesses of things. We're not talking about measuring positions of things accurately, like an astronomer would do. They would be working on the raw data. Yeah, I can We're tell you based about on making a picture. What 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 you're showing here, I like to my eye, I like the log function better than the other one. But uh oh, okay. just because you know, except for the green but, saturated parts, but I'm sure we can now, now you also have to remember that this is kind of an intermediate image. So we're going to take this and go into Photoshop where we can actually extract even more uh, detail, adjust the contrast and so forth right. with all kinds of uh, tools. And the other thing is um, if you notice down here, there's a selection here called channels. It goes 8, 16, and 32 bits. So 8-bit uh, is kind of the default way of, of uh, representing this is this 8-bit ref refers to 8 bits per pixel per channel of an image. So uh, a, a TIFF image or a JPEG image, say, by default, has 8 bits per pixel per channel. So there's 8 bits representing each pixel value in each color. With three colors, red, green, and blue, you have 24 bits to work with. And that gives you a certain number of gray levels, a certain range of tonalities in that image. If you double that, if you go to 16 bits per pixel per color, you get a lot more <laughs> tonality. So each bit represented a gray level. So uh, you have a lot more uh, possibility for a lot more different uh, gray levels within your image. We normally work with 16 bit just because it gives you more flexibility. So, for example, if you had eight bits per per channel, then each the red channel could have values from zero to two fifty five, the blue zero to two fifty five, and the green zero to two fifty five. That's correct. Okay. And if it's sixteen bit, it's thirty two thousand seven hundred sixty eight. I believe that's quite a bit more. For each channel, so you can see that's <laughs> a lot more. And the big and it doesn't really most of the time you probably would never notice a difference, but uh, when you start doing a lot of heavy duty stretches and uh, things then then you'll introduce some artifacts uh, w when you use a smaller uh, number of bits. Uh, so so you're recommending much more 16. So you recommend 16 I, for most of data. Work, I usually work in 16. The the downside is you have bigger files. Again, you have bigger files. Files are twice as big. So if you've got you know disk space problems, if you've got a relatively slow computer, then it's not very efficient. And again. Most of the time, you probably won't even notice the difference between between sixteen, between eight bit and sixteen bit. But we usually work in eight sixteen bit just because it gives us a little bit of cushion, more, much more flexibility to work with. Great. Okay. So I think this gives you the basic idea. Um, and what you do is uh, go through each of the filters uh, and do this sim same thing. Try to get the best looking image in Fitz Liberator for each uh, image from each filter. I'm not going to go through that process just in the in interest of saving time. I've already done that. Those those uh, files have been baking in the oven while we've been working, and we'll uh, we'll work with those files that are already been processed. So you would you would use Fitz Liberator to get each channel nice, get it the way you like it, then you'd save it as a TIFF file, and then you would uh, uh, with with 16 bits per channel, and then you'd move on to the next step. That's correct. Okay. So I'll go ahead and save this just to show you that. So I hit the save as, comes up with a file requester. 
gives the file name. The root of the root file name is the same as the fits file was, and the the file extension is TIFF. So it's going to be a TIFF file. In this case, I have 16 bits, so 16 bit selected. So it's going to be a 16 bit RG uh, grace sorry grayscale TIFF. We're in grayscale now. Uh, save, and I'll go ahead and save that. But but I won't go through the other ones. The process is similar. Most of the time. The observation, the, the observations are going to be similar for a given target. So the values that you put in are going to be roughly the same, but there may be differences in exposure that, that mean you use a different, slightly different stretch. I'll always use the same stretch function and usually use similar or identical peak uh, background and peak values and even scaled peak values. And usually it's just a matter of changing the block level and white level. Uh, to adjust the black and white points uh, to get them to be, I also want the images to match pretty much in tonality. So the the black level should be rough. The sky background should be roughly similar. I don't want the sky background to be dead black because I want some still want some detail there, and I want the white levels to be roughly the same. So now we're going to flip to Photoshop. So the next step is to use Photoshop to composite these. Uh, three separate images into a color composite image because right now we're still in grayscale. Now, um, like anything in Photoshop, there's about a billion ways to accomplish the same task. So the thing I want to do is get these images in into three different layers in Photoshop. So Photoshop has this uh, concept of image layers and in, completely independent images can be stacked in layers within Photoshop, and this is the big thing that Photoshop gives us for this particular thing we need to do. <laughs> so, Zol, I know that you're about to start showing us this in, in Photoshop, but can you can you recommend if you don't maybe you can't afford Photoshop, or is is there a a, a more um, light version of, or, or software that you might recommend most people can use as well? Well, this same procedure will work in uh, Photoshop Elements if you've got that, which is a much less expensive piece of software, but does a lot of the same things. It'll also work in the in the something called the GIMP, which if you're familiar with that, it's freeware, um, open source software that has a lot of the functionality of Photoshop. Um, so those those are the options. So um, I actually had this open already, but I will start from scratch and. What I, what I find the most convenient thing to do is to do this through uh, part of uh, the Adobe suite called Br Bridge. So Photoshop is part of uh, Adobe's Creative Suite package. This includes a whole bunch of different graphic software. Photoshop is probably the best, uh, best known, but an ancillary thing to Photoshop that comes with the Creative Suite package, also I believe if you just buy Photoshop, you can buy Photoshop just by itself. I believe it also comes with this bridge, which is kind of a file browser, image browser, uh, and has a lot of connections with Photoshop making things kind of convenient. So what I like to do is open this in bridge. These are actually my three, uh, oh, I'm sorry, those are the FITS files. <laughs> These are my three TIFF files. And you can see there's little thumbnails right here in bridge of what those files look like. And that's, a nice one, little, that's one for each uh, filter, it looks like. One for each filter. Here's 606, 814, and 438. So that's the V, the I band or, or red image, and this is the B or blue band image. Okay, before we get too much further along, I have a question yeah. here for you okay. uh, from uh, uh, Autumn Ginkgo Leaves. He goes, I came late to the lecture, but would like to know about Fitz Liberator's color temperature adjustment capabilities. And what is the range? Okay, Fitz Liberator works only in black and white. So there's no color temperature that you apply. There's no color processing that you do in Fitz Liberator. It's purely black and white. Uh, we have lots of color options in Photoshop, and we'll get to that. Uh, maybe before I start, I should say something about uh, color management. Uh, it's a little bit outside of this, but it helps to have a color managed workflow, which simply means that you know what your image is going to look like going between different pieces of software and uh, from your monitor to a printer, say, or from different monitors. So 
there are various ways to handle color management. It has to do with uh, calibrating and profiling your monitor. And again, that's a topic for another whole discussion. But if you want to think more about color, you get into a color managed workflow. But it's not really that critical for this. It's more a matter of uh, when you want to match what you see on your screen to another screen or a printer or something like that. So, um, so the thing here, we have our three black and white images. And we're going to open them. And uh, Adobe Bridge lets us open these all at once in Photoshop, put them in layers. So what we do is up here in the Tools menu, we go down to Photoshop, and it says Load Files into Photoshop Layers. Oh, that's exactly what we want to do. So we'll go ahead and do that. And it will go off and open those images and plop them into one document, one Photoshop document, that has all three of those images in separate layers in the same document. Now we can do this manually. We could open those three images and drag and drop one to the other or load them. Uh, there's, Photoshop has a, a place function which allows you to drop an image from your uh, file system onto in the same document. Those are all valid ways of doing this. But this is the one I like the best because it's the most convenient and I'm all about convenience. So now we have, uh, and the, there's a, again a lot of stuff about Photoshop. I'll just highlight the very most important thing. So over here we have what's called the layers palette. This is a map of what our image, what our document looks like to Photoshop. So right now we have a document with three image layers in it. So we see a little tiny thumbnail of our image and a description that. It, when we when we open the files this way, the description is the file name, which is nice and convenient because it links back to that, you know, we know that that's the right file we've gotten. So again, here's our, now we've, uh, it was pretty long, so it's cut off the file name. So here we go. So we have 606, 16, and 438. Now I will rearrange, the nice thing about this layers palette, you can go rearrange stuff. So uh, I'll just drag one layer on top of the other. So now I've arranged them so that A14, which is the reddest image, is on top. 606, which is intermediate wavelength, is in the middle. 438, it says the bluest image is on the bottom. That's my way of working. I always do it this way, <laughs> just so I, I know. Uh, I need all the crutches I can get. Okay, so we're ready to go. Now, one more detail. Um, we're working in black and white so far. We need to make a color image. Photoshop isn't going to make a color image right now because it's in gray mode. It tells us up in the up in the bar up, up in the title bar of this image it says gray. Oh, uh, I should have mentioned that I'm working in uh, Photoshop version five here. That's not the latest version of Photoshop, but the, all this stuff works with all the most recent versions of Photoshop, probably going back to version three or four. I don't think there's anything in here that we're doing that wasn't around back in version three or four. Um, but there's a new version out, version six, which has a lot of nice upgrades. It's worth it. But uh, right now we're working in Photoshop five, just because I think that's probably a better common denominator to work in. And things are a little clearer right now in the interface. Okay, uh, so, real quick, Zolt, uh, before we go yeah. on, um, Brad Whitmore is asking why TIFF images rather than JPEGs or something else? Why did you save those as TIFF images? Good question. Uh, the reason I take them to as TIFF images is because that's the only option that Fitz Liberator gives you. But the reason that that's <laughs> the only option that Fitz Liberator gives you is that that's the best uh, version. JPEG. The big downside of JPEG is, one, it only supports 8 bits per pixel. It does not support 16 bits per pixel. So if you want that option, having more bit depth, JPEGs are out. Number two, the big thing is that it, has, it, there, it uses what's called lossy compression, which means it makes the file sizes physically smaller, so it uses fewer bytes to store your image, but that means it degrades the image somewhat. So yeah, that's, that's a compression. Wanna, it's a compression format. Also, it compresses, right? The that's JPEGs. correct. It compresses them. You have the option of <clears throat> of compressing a little bit or a lot, and but even at the smallest amount of compression that that you can apply to a JPEG, it still you still lose information in your image, which is what we don't what we want to avoid. TIFF 
um, has has options for several different ways to it also compresses the image but it compresses it in a way that's lossless what's said called lossless so it doesn't actually change the pixels themselves when it opens up that image all the information all the pixels are displayed are re restored as is from that image so that's why we use tiff Great. And there's just one more clarification from uh, Autumn Ginkgo Leaves, and I don't think I understand this, but I'll read it. <laughs> anyway, it says when you responded to the color temperature adjustment capabilities, you said, uh, she said, or he said, I'm sorry, I don't know which one. Um, Thanks. I was thinking more in terms of data extraction and adjusting Kelvin for the monochrome image. Sorry for not being clearer. I'm not quite sure what that means. A data yeah, extracting and uh, adjusting Kelvin? Yeah, you have to remember that, that we're dealing with black and white images from the get-go. So the camera on the telescope has used a filter to sample part of the whole electromagnetic spectrum, all the visible light, that all the light that Hubble is sensitive to, the filter in the camera has picked a one, uh, one particular range of colors so camera gets it when it produces that image it's a gray image there's no color information whatsoever the only color information you have is that that image was we know what wavelengths uh, what what range of colors that that image represents but that's all we know that's right for example in the one you have showing it's it's with the f438 filter that is the uh, blue filter at 438 I, I think it's nanometers so that's we know right. that the value of every pixel in there from 0 to 16 bits is some brightness level in that region of the filter that it can see so this is all blue all of the even That's though correct. we're seeing it as a grayscale those values from 0 to whatever they are are brightnesses in the blue area of the filter the blue part of the spectrum That's correct so the camera has done all the color selection that we can do at this point um, so we have no nothing to say about that anymore. <laughs> now, you know, again, when we go to composite this in color, then we have choices and options as to how to assign these colors. So the first thing we need to do is make this into a document that can produce color. Right now, we cannot produce color in this document because it's a grayscale image. So we go to image mode, and you see that grayscale is highlighted, is checked. That means it's a grayscale image. We go back down to here and select RGB color. And again, you can go down here to 16 bits. The, uh, sorry, the image mode allows us to change the color mode as well as the number of bits per channel. I could drop this back down to 8 bits per channel, um, but I'm going to uh, keep it 16 bit. doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, but I do want to change it to RGB color. Uh, you might be wondering about 32 bit. Um, that's that's an exercise for the reader. <laughs> that, that um, uh, that's a topic for another discussion, I think. We won't get into 32-bit <laughs> right now. Um, so, okay, uh, it did ask me if I want to merge these. That means, do I want to flatten this image? No, I definitely don't want to flatten the image. I want to preserve the layers. So now I have a color image. It, uh, you look in the toolbar now, it says RGB 16. So that means it's a color image, an RGB image. You're still seeing grayscale because these images started out as grayscale. So now the fun part begins. Now we can actually start to do something and get color in here. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by telling Photoshop that I want to apply, I want to render this layer in a color, in a hue. So the way I do that is with a hue saturation adjustment layer. Now again, there's a million ways to do the same thing in Photoshop. The most explicit way is to go to layer, the layer menu, new adjustment layer, hue saturation. Now adjustment layer means that it will create a new layer in my layers palette in my document. But this layer is not an image layer. It's a description layer. It tells Photoshop how to uh, modify the pixels in this image. It won't actually change any pixels. So I, I uh, uh, what I'm going to do is, this is the I band image, so I'm going to say I, I'm going to give this a name so that I remember what this is talking about. So it's it's going from uh, the I filter and making that red. I'm checking use previous layer to cl create clipping mask. A clipping mask is a little bit of confusing terminology, but what that means is that this layer, this adjustment is going to apply only to the layer directly below it. It's not going to apply to anything that's uh, below that layer. 
So now, uh, another important part of the Photoshop interface is this adjustments palette or panel. And this tells me, this allows me to change how these, this adjustment, what this adjustment is doing. So the first thing I want to do is say colorize. There's basically two modes to the, this uh, hue saturation adjustment. Uh, one is hue saturation lightness, simply hue saturation lightness. The other is colorize. I want colorize. So this will tell Photoshop to convert this black and white layer into color. And so you see, I, I hit colorize, and it turned it sort of red. So the reason it's sort of red is because the saturation by default is down at 25%. I want to first thing I want to do, drag that all the way to the right to 100%. I want the maximum saturation. You don't have to do that, but uh, if you do that, you get the most, the widest range of colors in this image. Now, hue tells tells it what color to make this. So as I drag this slider through this little spectrum you see here, it changes to whatever color it's pointing to, and it all, the number also changes. So this what we're doing is dragging this color around a color wheel. So hue is kind of a circular thing. So you can imagine riding around a wheel with colors on the outside, the colors in this in this spectrum here. So uh, the numbers are, uh, by convention, they are such that red is zero, uh, green is 120, 120, or a third of the way around. We've got three colors, red, green, and blue. So we're going around this color wheel in thirds. 120 is green, and 240, 240 degrees is two-thirds of the way around the, the, the uh, wheel. Uh, 240 is blue. So you can say, see that color change as we go around. So red, this is the I-band image, so we're going to make this red. The last thing you want to do is change this lightness. As you can see, it's going from red, where the image is darkest, to white, where the image is brightest. What we really want this to do is go from black or dark, where the image is darkest, to the maximum color value, or red in this case, where the image is brightness. Not white, but red in this case. So I'll drop this lightness down to minus 50. Now again, these numbers are not, you don't have to adhere precisely to these numbers. These numbers give you the broadest range of color. If you want to extract the most color out of an image, these are the numbers that you use. And we're done with that. So we do the same thing to the other ones. Uh, I'll turn this this top layer off for the time being. Uh, you can turn do that with this little eye, eye uh, tool here. And I'll do the same thing. I'll do it quicker. <laughs> um, so I've added a hue saturation layer here. I'll say colorize. This time it's the middle filter, so I'll make that green. I'll make that 120. In fact, I can type in 120. And again, crank the saturation up, change the lightness. Uh, I wish you could change those defaults, but you can't. But what you can do is write actions. An action is a recording of a number of Photoshop steps, and then you can play those act, that action back, and it will repeat those steps exactly as you perform them. That makes things go a lot faster. I'll flip down to the blue, do the same thing, colorize, uh, I'll type in 240 for blue, drag the lightness of the saturation, make the lightness minus 50, and there's our blue. So there are our three images. Now, unfortunately, you still see them as separate images. So there's a trick. Here's the final trick. So <laughs> the trick is that Photoshop can render this layer, can display this layer in lots of different ways, a bewildering number of ways. Here are all the ways you can render this, this layer. There's only one that we're interested in here. You can play around with the others. They're not relevant for this particular thing we're doing. The only one that's relevant is lighten. They do a lot of neat things. If you're, you know, if you do digital photography, there's a lot of neat things you can do with those. But what we're interested in here is this screen mode. Screen mode tells Photoshop to project these images perfectly registered as if you're projecting them with a slide projector onto a screen with colored filters in front of each separate slide projector. So that's exactly what we've done. We've created a filter, a color filter. So we're kind of mimicking the filter that was in the camera uh, with a with a uh, adjustment layer, and we're changing this mode to screen. So we are projecting these images onto it themselves, and so we actually have a color image now. 
it doesn't look uh, all that colorful, <laughs> but it's our first cut at it. And now here's where kind of the fun starts. And I'm not going to go through a lot of this because I think we're actually kind of running out of time. And this is where the real kind of subjective stuff happens. Can um, I point something out real quick? Yeah. Can you show us just the blue channel again? Yes. So one thing that I find interesting about these images is that if you notice, you look at one filter um, and then you compare it with, the, that's the red filter, right? Or is that this blue? Is the, oh, um, this is the blue. The, this okay. Is the and then if you also, and then compare that with the red, you'll see that it was much brighter in right. the red. See how much brighter the red is than the blue? That means these galaxies had more photons at the wavelengths red filter than the blue filter. And I find that very interesting. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, you can actually see the differences in the image. And there's a real differences. We're not making anything up here. We're not just pulling color out of thin air. The color comes from the actual differences in brightness in the different images, which are brought about because the stuff that's coming into the telescope is different colors, is different brightnesses in different colors. So as Tony pointed out, in the red image, the the bulges, the centers of these galaxies are much brighter. There's a lot more red light there. In the blue, uh, the the bulges are darker, but the the spiral arms, the spiral arm features are much more delineated. There's a lot more uh, sharp blue light there. Probably a lot of stars being born there, things like that. So that's really, I just I wanted to point that out. I just think that's really neat. Right. And so, in fact, we can see right away but just in this region here, if I zoom up, we're starting to see pixels here because this is a reduced resolution image. So you can actually see here that there's a little, there's actually a little galaxy in the background here, which is much farther away than Stefan's Quintet. That's so cool. So it appears much smaller. It's actually a, you know, big spiral galaxy. It's probably a big spiral galaxy. Most spiral galaxies are roughly the same size. So it's much farther away. But it's showing through this arm of this foreground galaxy. And you can see already that this, uh, spiral, the center of the spiral is much redder than these little uh, star forming regions in in this uh, in this Stevens Quintet galaxy. That is so cool. Uh, real quick, I know we're running out of time, but I need to, uh, one more question. Uh, so the FITS files from the website are all pre-aligned? No need to move or rotate them? In, in this case, uh, in this particular set of data, yes, they are all aligned. I should have mentioned that. They're all registered. And in fact, this particular data set is something called a high-level science product. So these are have been processed by astronomers to be the best processing for this particular set of data. And uh, this particular data set is actually a little mosaic. There's actually four separate exposures. So one, uh, two, three, four separate fields that have been stitched together. Uh, so these high-level science products, uh, in this particular case, they're perfectly registered. Uh, right. Um, uh, not in, in not in every case will not in every time will that be the case. So, any random data set you get, you might have different. The, the telescope may have been rotated to some other angle uh, with the different exposures. So, uh, the uh, we'll often just go into Photoshop and and rearrange the pictures to to uh, make them register. In fact, you can composite images from different cameras that will have different resolutions and different field sizes. So all these kind of yeah, that, that can be a tutorial all on its own. Uh, exactly. we, we've only got about five or seven more minutes, but I want to get one more question in. Is more noise reduction needed in the blue channel as in as with the DLSR? SLR, sorry. Um, in fact, often that's the case. Um, uh, less in the case of this particular camera because it has um, Let's see, which way does it go? Uh, ACS has more red sensitivity and WIFC3 has more blue sensitivity. So this particular camera has pretty good blue sensitivity. So, um, but in general, the blue images do tend to be noisier. And yeah, you can apply some noise reduction. There are standard noise reduction techniques available in Photoshop. We tend to kind of stay away from uh, too much noise reduction and too much sharing kinds of things like that just because for one thing the images we get from Hubble are pretty darn good to begin with so we don't really need to do much of that 
Um, we also don't want to introduce too many artifacts that you get from sharpening and noise reduction and stuff. So um, I will, I, what I want to do though before I stop is I do want to show real quick a version of this image that I had already worked on a little bit uh, and show some of the things that you can do. thought I had that open, but obviously I didn't. Uh, so I will open, uh, here it is. So again, I'm taking the ready-made cake wow. out of the oven. Look at that. So these are the same files I was just working with, but I've applied uh, some more uh, adjustments. So the main thing I've done is applied some curves adjustments and separate curves adjustments to each layer. So this is changing the, the balance in the colors the balance between the different exposures, so which will affect the colors that you get. Here is color balancing. I don't know if this is an answer to the question that we got earlier, but this is where color balancing comes from. You can balance the colors in lots of different ways. There is a color balance adjustment. Uh, I will apply curves to each layer separately. So this is the curve that's applied to the to the I band layer. Uh, you know what I said about consistency? These uh, layers are backwards in this image, in this file. Uh, here is the curves for the green layer or the V layer, and this is the curves for uh, the I band layer. So you can see those curves, those are different curves adjustment, different amount of brightening. In, in particular, the green, what ends up, sorry, what ends up being the red. I've actually uh, darkened it quite a bit relative to the other one, so taken out some red cast from the background. Um, the other thing is uh, to increase the contrast overall, and that just pops pops the colors and pops the brightness. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. So you've so had several curves off, per layer, it looks like, right? Uh, I essentially have one I have an extra curve in here. I'm not sure what it's doing. Curve, yeah. I don't think that one's doing anything. So, oh, okay. Oh, that's doing something. But, uh, yeah, I have a couple of curves for each individual layer, and then I have some curves at the top that apply to everything, whatever the, the stuff at the top applies to everything below it. I see. So, yeah, these are just changing the contrast. Man, that's beautiful. Um, so I take all these off. You can see what we started with which is pretty much what we had in the other one. The numbers are a little bit different. but um, does, does Photoshop Elements have these curve, this curve capability too? I guess it does. I, I'm not that familiar with Elements. i got to okay. go look that up. Okay. Um, so that's kind of, there you kind of have it. Now the rest of it is, again, the, the digital darkroom stuff. So you <laughs> go crazy or we tend to be a little, we try to be kind of conservative and not do anything too crazy. But uh, you can uh, you can work in your digital darkroom. Wow, that's great, Zolt. So thank you very much. This was that's an awesome, awesome image. So now we have a taste for what it's like to try and get data straight from Hubble and uh, and make our own pictures with it. So thank you very much, Zolt. I want to remind everybody that um, even though this will get posted on the YouTube channel and it won't be we won't be able to take questions live, we will still be monitoring the. Uh, the video once it's posted on YouTube and if you leave comments there uh, we'll be more than happy to, to try and answer them uh, there as well uh, so I hope this was helpful for you it sure was great for me and I really enjoyed learning how uh, these images were made so thank you guys all for watching and I guess we'll see you next time thanks for coming thanks for coming